Hello, Newark Baptist Church, and welcome to our weekly Bible study. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit would guide and direct us into all truth tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are continuing our series called Understanding the Jews, and this is now lesson number 173 with tonight's lesson entitled King Solomon, Part 9. So last week, we took a step back to a time before Solomon had received his gift of wisdom from God. And that occurred in the fourth year of his reign. But in the very first year, Solomon was already thinking about putting the plans for his new temple into motion. And simultaneous with those thoughts, Solomon received a delegation from the king of Tyre to congratulate him on his ascension and recognizing that visit as a great opportunity. Well, Solomon sent a letter back with those emissaries for them to give to their king. And in that letter, Solomon made the case for why he needed to build a temple and to make a very substantial request for King Hiram's assistance. And we managed to get through Solomon's justification for what was to be a pretty substantial project and ended the night just before we got to what it was that he was asking for. So tonight, we want to begin with that request. So let's reread the opening verses of chapter 5 and pick things up where we left off. So we're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. The scripture reads, And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants unto Solomon, for he had heard that they had anointed him king in the room of his father. For Hiram was ever a lover of David. And Solomon sent to Hiram, saying, Thou knowest how that David my father could not build an house unto the name of the Lord his God for the wars which were about him on every side, until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. But now... The Lord my God hath given me rest on every side, so that there is neither adversary nor evil occurring. And behold, I purpose to build an house unto the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spake unto David my father, saying, Thy son, whom I will set upon thy throne in thy room, he shall build a house unto my name. Now therefore command thou that they hew me cedar trees out of Lebanon, and my servants shall be with thy servants, and unto thee will I give hire for thy servants according to all that thou shalt appoint. For thou knowest that there is not among us any that can skill to hew timber like unto the Sidonians. Now, we have already studied the first five verses in this passage. So, I want to jump right to verse 6. So, let's reread that one verse again. 1 Kings 5, 6. <clears throat> Scripture reads, Now, therefore, command thou that they hew me cedar trees out of Lebanon, and my servants shall be with thy servants. And unto thee will I give hire for thy servants, according to all that thou shalt appoint. For thou knowest that there is not among us any that can skill to hew timber like unto the Sidonians. Now I'm sure that, well, Solomon included his appreciation for King Hiram's well wishes for his new administration. But in addition to that appreciation, 
Solomon also made a request. A request for a very substantial commitment on the part of King Hiram. Solomon was asking for assistance in two important areas. Not only for raw materials, he was also asking for a great deal of labor. Solomon knows that he needs both of those things to accomplish what he had in mind. Oh, but Solomon also knows that there is a limit to how much he can expect to trade on his father's name. David's good name. Solomon had been blessed by God. He was currently enjoying a time of peace with his neighbors. And he surely wanted to keep it that way. Especially with the king of Tyre. Because at that time, the city of Tyre was the principal city of the Phoenicians. And the Phoenicians were formidable and rugged in battle. In fact, those two Phoenician cities that were mentioned in this passage were supposed to be within the borders of Israel, but they weren't. And they weren't because the Israelites didn't want to take them, or they just weren't able to do it, weren't willing to try to do it. We know that the Lord had promised Israel that if they persisted in their efforts and did not falter in their faith, he would drive out their enemies from before them. But the fact remains that the totality of the promised land was never completely taken. Never. Now Joshua, you remember of course, he was the one who led the people into the land. By and large, I think we would all agree that Joshua was a faithful servant of the Lord. Fought many battles, and he did overcome a lot of Canaanite tribes. But right before Joshua died, the Lord told Joshua clearly that he did not finish the job. The nation of Israel did not yet possess all the land that had been promised to them. So let's go back to Joshua for a minute. Joshua chapter 13. We're going to read six verses, one through six. The scripture reads, Now Joshua was old and stricken in years. And the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years. And there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. This is the land that yet remaineth. All the borders of the Philistines and all Geshuri from Sihor, which is before Egypt, even unto the borders of Ekron northward, which is counted to the Canaanite. Five lords of the Philistines, the Gazathites, and the Ashtothites, and the Eshkelonites, the Gittites, and the Ekronites, and the Avites. From the south, all the land of the Canaanites, and Miara, that is beside the Sidonians, unto Aphek, to the borders of the Amorites, and the land of the Giblites, and all Lebanon, toward the sun rising, from Baal Gad under Mount Hermon unto the entering into Hamath. All the inhabitants of the hill country from Lebanon unto Mizraphath Maim and all the Sidonians. Them will I drive out from before the children of Israel. 
Only divide thou it by lot unto the Israelites for an inheritance, as I have commanded thee. So, these verses lay out all the land that had not yet been possessed by Israel. Land that should have been theirs. And among those areas not taken was the land of the Sidonians in Lebanon. And that land in Lebanon also included the city of Tyre. Now, beginning in verse 7 of this chapter and going forward for the next six chapters, God reminds Joshua of all the land that was given to Israel as an inheritance. The land given to each tribe by God through Moses, through Joshua, and through Eleazar the priest. And when we get up into chapter 19, we find the particular tribe that was supposed to be occupying the land that the king of Tyre was sitting on when Solomon wrote his letter to him. For that, let's go to Joshua 19 and verse 24. And of course, this is a whole list that we're getting into here, and I'm going to pull out this one because this is the one that we need to look at now. Scripture reads, And the fifth lot came out for the tribe of the children of Asher, according to their families. So from that verse down to verse 31, we have the land that was to be the inheritance of the tribe of Asher. And down in verses 28 and 29, we find the two cities mentioned by Solomon in his letter, Sidon and Tyre. Sometimes the spellings are a little bit different, but same cities. Joshua 19, 28 and 29, we'll go back to the scriptures. And they read, beginning in verse 28, And Hebron, and Rehob, and Haman, and Cana, even unto great Zidon, or Sidon. And then the coast turneth to Ramah, and to the strong city, Tyre. And the coast turneth to Hosea, and the outgoings thereof, or at the sea, from the coast, to Oxib. Now here in this list, probably weren't counting, but there are 22 cities and five villages mentioned. But only two of them, just two, have a descriptive adjective placed in front of them. Only two. Which two? Well, that would be the same two that are in 1 Kings chapter 5. Sidon and Tyre. And what were those adjectives? Great and strong. Great, Sidon, and strong, Tyre. Now, whether Israel tried and quit, or they didn't try at all, doesn't really matter. The Lord told them to take that land, and they didn't. And because of that, Solomon now must go hat in hand to a foreign king who is camped out on land that should have been within the nation of Israel. That undesirable situation was the result of a failure by Israel to follow God's will. But thankfully, David, King David, 
was at least successful in entering into a peace treaty with the king of Tyre, specifically King Hiram. Treaty that was still in place when Solomon came to the throne. A treaty that was in Solomon's best interest to keep. But what Solomon was asking for was no small request. Solomon wanted materials and labor from Lebanon for a temple that was to be built in Jerusalem. So to more fully appreciate the scope and logistics of this project, we need to get the lay of the land. And for that, we're going to go to Exhibit 179, which is a period map of the cities involved. So if you're looking at this slide now, in just about the middle of the slide, you can see the nation of Israel, and of course the city of Jerusalem, appearing well, in the approximate center of the country. And to the north, you will see the city of Tyre. And about 20 miles north of there is the city of Sidon. Now, by the time of Alexander the Great, most of the population of Tyre was actually located on an island about a half mile off the coast, uh, and which was a subject of a pretty famous siege. But that's a subject for another day. We're talking about 900 BC versus 300 BC. Now again, those two cities, Sidon and Tyre, were given to the tribe of Asher for a possession. There was a pretty big problem. Well, not for God, but for the Israelites. As you can see by the geography, before Sidon could be taken, the Israelites would first have to take the city of Tyre. In Hebrew, the name Tyre literally means a rock. Tyre was a fortified city built on a rock. And the Israelites did not have sufficient faith to take that city built on a rock. Therefore, well, they could not take Sidon either. Now, this gives us some understanding about why those two cities remained outside of Israel's borders. But looking at this map, you should be able to see another more practical issue concerning logistics. The Sidonians, of course, the Sidonians, who gained fame as hewers of wood, got their reputation by cutting trees in the forest of Lebanon near to the city of Sidon. But if we can keep Exhibit 179 up there for a moment. I want you to look where Sidon is, vis-a-vis -vis Jerusalem. That's over 100 miles, folks. <laughs> now, there were no tractor trailers in those days, nor were there any interstate highways. There were dirt roads, and I would think that neither you nor I would want to ride on any of those roads. So they didn't have trucks. What did they have? That's a good question. So I did a little research concerning modes of transportation that were available around 900 BC. And in particular, Vehicles that could carry very heavy cargo. For 
talking about huge trees from which tall columns would have to be fashioned. And so our next exhibit shows what I found. We're going to go to exhibit 180, and I have entitled this a little bit tongue-in-cheek, the semi-truck equivalent in 900 BC. So this drawing shows some logs on a cart. And those logs don't really look all that big and thick. And surely, the lumber that Solomon was talking about would have been much bigger. And we don't know if the wood was milled in Lebanon or some of it, or if it was shipped raw and then milled in Jerusalem. But either way, we're talking about gigantic shipping issues and substantial shipping costs. In fact, shipping may have been more costly than the trees. On top of that, we're going to find out that Solomon was asking for stone and skilled stone cutters. And he wanted them to come along with the stone. Again, since Tyre was literally built on rock, the availability of stone in that area was not an issue. But getting it to Jerusalem would be. Now to be sure, two things to keep in mind. First, I'm not certain if Tyre actually sent their own stone to Jerusalem or if they used stone that was local. And I say that because, well, the area of Jerusalem had no shortage of stone either. If that was the case, then Tyre would have supplied only the craftsmen to cut the stone. Uh, or it could be that the stone in the area of Tyre was just of better quality than was the stone that could be found near Jerusalem. Secondly, it's noted in 1 Chronicles chapter 22 that King David had already accumulated quite a lot of wood and stone and craftsmen for the building of the temple while he was yet still alive. And listen, oh, David got a lot of those materials also from the king of Tyre. So here comes Solomon again, going back to the same well, the king of Tyre, again. Now he may have believed correctly that the materials that he already had still was not enough. But he was definitely pushing the envelope. He was putting the squeeze on the king of Tyre for what amounts to the third time. So having gone through all this background, I think we can surmise that Solomon may have been just a little nervous during that time that he had to wait to hear what King Hiram's response was going to be. What if Hiram told Solomon he had a lot of nerve? He'd already given more than his share towards this project. What then? What would Solomon do then? Perhaps Hiram didn't know that Solomon was not just building a temple. He was thinking much bigger than that. In fact, that's why the materials that David had put in store were not going to be enough. In addition to the temple, Solomon was planning a massive complex. One that would in fact dwarf the temple proper. And to give us some perspective, I want to show you an artist's rendering that depicts the totality 
of Solomon's plan. And for that, we'll go to Exhibit 181. And we're calling this, well, in, in the slide, it's actually called Temple Area in Solomon's time, but it includes the palace complex. Of course, I don't have a photo to show you, but this artist's rendering does approximate what the entire project would have looked like upon completion. So to begin with, you can see that there was a wall that completely surrounded the entirety of the complex. Now, part of that wall would have been pre-existing. But under Solomon, it was expanded. And in addition to the new portions of the wall, well, the old sections were repaired and refurbished. Upon completion, that wall would have presented a pretty impressive appearance. And of course, beyond the obvious cosmetic and aesthetic value, that wall also served as protection for the temple and for everything else on the Temple Mount. Of course, our main focus, our main focus right now is the temple. And if that slide is still up there, uh, you can see it in this exhibit on the far right hand side of the slide. Now in this particular rendering, there's a pretty tall tower structure over the temple doors. Now I've seen other representations of the temple with a little height over the entrance, but this one is unusually tall. In any event, I did choose this particular exhibit because it includes the rest of the buildings that Solomon erected in what was going to be a very ambitious undertaking. So on this exhibit, again, if you go across that large courtyard from the temple, the first building that you come to is marked as the Porch of the Throne. And that porch was attached to Solomon's grand throne room. And we have some information about his throne room up in chapter 10. So I want to go there so we can pick that up. 1 Kings 10 and verses 18 through 20. The scripture reads, Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with the best gold. The throne had six steps, and the top of the throne was round behind, and there were stays on either side on the place of the seat, and two lions stood beside the stays, and twelve lions stood there on the one side and on the other upon the six steps. There was not the light made in any kingdom. So what we find in this passage was not part of the temple. This is the place where Solomon sat in judgment. And on one side was the porch of the throne, and on the other side was the porch of the pillars. The throne room with its pillars and porches was actually larger by itself than was the new temple. We find the dimensions for that porch alone in chapter 7. So let's go there, 1 Kings 7, and we just need one verse, verse 6. Scripture reads, And he made a porch of pillars. The length thereof was 50 cubits, and the breadth thereof 30 cubits. And the porch was before them, and the other pillars and the thick beam were before them. So this porch, which we saw back in Exhibit 181, as connected to the throne room, was 50 cubits by 30 cubits. That's 75 feet by 45 feet. 
gives you a total of 3,375 square feet. On the other hand, the new temple was 60 cubits by 20 cubits, or 90 feet by 30 feet. And that gives us a total of 2,700 square feet. So if we're not counting the height of the structure, just the footprint, then this porch of pillars alone was about 25% larger than the temple. I apologize for throwing all these numbers at you, but I just wanted to start giving you an idea of the scope of this project by using the temple as a standard. Now again, this porch of the throne and porch of pillars would have been adjuncts to Solomon's grand throne room itself. And when we get a little further into Solomon's reign, uh, we will talk about the visit he had from the queen of Sheba. And this throne room is where Solomon would have received her when she arrived in Jerusalem. In fact, there's a famous painting by Edward Pointer that captures that scene. And I want to show it to you because it takes the description that we just read in 1 Kings chapter 10 and it presents us with a visual depiction. One that gives us at least a sense about how that throne room may have looked. So let's go to exhibit 182, Solomon's throne room. Now, in this scene, you can see that Solomon has actually descended down a couple of steps to receive the queen, and his actual throne or his seat, where he would normally be sitting, is not shown. That would have been a little to the right off this picture. But we can see the 12 lions mentioned in verse 20, two on each step, one on one side of the step and one on the other side. We can also see the pillars and the vast amount of gold plating that was used. And overall, I think we can get the feel of what was an awesome and a magnificent setting. And accordingly, the scriptures told us there in verse 20, there wasn't a throne room in any other kingdom that could compare to it. It was definitely something to behold. But we're just getting started with Solomon's compound. Next, if we can now go back to exhibit 181, we'll see another structure. And that will be what the Bible calls, interestingly enough, the house of the forest of Lebanon. So here we have Solomon's temple palace complex. And on this exhibit, the house of the forest of Lebanon is that somewhat shorter but longer building next to Solomon's throne room and its adjacent porches. And we get some information about this structure in the same chapter that we just left, chapter 7. So let's go there. 1 Kings 7, we're going to read verses 2 through 5. Scripture reads, He built also the house of the forest of Lebanon. The length thereof was an hundred cubits, and the breadth thereof fifty cubits, and the height thereof thirty cubits, upon four rows of cedar pillars, with cedar beams upon the pillars. And it was covered with cedar above upon the beams that lay on 45 pillars, 15 in a row. And there were windows in three rows, 
and light was against light in three ranks, and all the doors and posts were square with the windows, and light was against light in three ranks. So again, if we're only considering the footprint of the building, it would have covered over 11,000 square feet. Remember the temple, 2,700. And it needed to be quite large because it literally contained a man-made forest within its confines. We see here that there were three rows of 15 pillars for a total of 45 pillars. And these pillars were not made of stone. They were made of cedar wood from Lebanon. Hence the name, the House of the Forest of Lebanon. It was the tip of the hat to them. And it would literally feel like you were walking through a forest if you were in there. Can't even imagine. Now these cedar pillars supported a house that itself had three levels. And three rows of windows that faced each other from across the courtyard allowing light to pass through the building from one side to the other. What a sight that would have been. Now, nobody knows for certain what the true purpose of this building actually was. But we uh, get a little hint when we get into chapter 10. So I want to go there now and pick up a verse in chapter 10. That would be verse 17. And the scripture reads, And he made 300 shields of beaten gold. Three pounds of gold went to one shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. So we see that Solomon kept 300 shields, shields covered with gold, in that building. Of course, an ordinary soldier would not have been using a shield such as that. So it could be that this building served as an armory for the royal guard, at least in part. We also learned in verse 21, which I didn't read, that it also contained Vessels of pure gold. And folks, that's about as much as I can tell you about the possible purpose of that building. It was magnificent. So we looked at what I'll call the business portion of the complex. And now, well, we need to move to Solomon's palace. His personal living quarters. And that, too, was shown back in Exhibit 181. And it was a short walk from there to his place of business, to the throne room, his royal throne. So in Chapter 7, we see a reference to his personal quarters and the separate house that he built for his wife, the daughter of Pharaoh. So let's go to 1 Kings 7. Verses 8 through 12. Scripture reads, now we're talking about Solomon's house, and his house, where he dwelt, had another court within the porch, which was of the like work. Solomon, Solomon made also a house for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he had taken to wife, like unto this porch. All of these, were of costly stones, according to the measures of hewed stones, sawed with saws, within and without, even from the foundation unto the coping, and so on the outside toward the great court. And the foundation was of costly stones, even great stones, stones of ten cubits, and stones of eight cubits. And above were costly stones, after the measures of hewed stones and cedars. 
and the great court round about was with three rows of hewed stones and a row of cedar beams, both for the inner court of the house of the Lord and for the porch of the house, meaning his house. So it's clear Solomon wanted all of these buildings in the compound to be coordinated by a similar appearance using the same materials. And we learn here that his personal residence was in fact built of the same quality of materials as were in his throne room and all the other structures. The foundations of his house consisted of great stones as high as 15 feet. And his house that sat on top of that foundation was also made of other costly stones and cedar wood. And Solomon's house was surrounded by a great courtyard. And the cedar that he used in the temple was the same wood that he used in his own house. But needless to say, this project was going to dwarf anything that the king of Tyre had ever been a part of in the past. This was going to be monumental. So now the question is raised. How will King Hiram respond to Solomon's request for assistance? Now, in the way of review, the Kingdom of Tyre had already built the house for the previous king, King David. And in addition, Tyre had provided many materials already for the present project. Materials that King David had laid in store for this new temple before he died. Materials that in large part also came from the king of Tyre. Now it is true that Solomon had in fact been appointed by the Lord to build this new temple. No question. And Solomon was right to include that mandate in his letter, the one he sent to King Hiram. But there was no mention of all that other stuff, all those extra buildings that actually made the project many times bigger than just a temple. Was Hiram aware of all that? We don't know. But he was surely aware of what his kingdom had already provided. So how would he respond? There definitely was no guarantee that it would be positive. So Lord willing, when we get back together next week, we will see what King Hiram has to say about what he is being asked to do. So in the interim, please remember to pray for all those on our prayer list. And until next time, Shalom.